Hi, I'm Dr. Steve Elias, and welcome to the Vain Podcast. Respect the elders, embrace the new, and encourage the improbable and impractical without bias. Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to the uh, Vain Podcast. I'm uh, Dr. Steve Elias. So today we're going to talk about some uh, some stuff that's that's relatively new uh, in terms of uh, technologies, uh, and the the theme of this podcast is uh, really um, venous thrombosis, the uh, changing paradigm. Uh, are there things that are changing in terms of our thought process and also the technologies that are uh, available? Uh, with us today is uh, Marquis Algarinos from the University of uh, Pittsburgh, and he just told me we'll be splitting his time over in Athens, Greece as well. Um, he's an, a vascular surgeon. Uh, Tom Burnick is, works, uh, I work with him actually, he's the chief of vascular over at uh, Englewood Health in Englewood, uh, New Jersey, a vascular surgeon, obviously. Uh, Mitch Silver from Ohio Health, who's an interventional cardiologist, but not your run-of-the-mill interventional cardiologist, as he says. He takes care of all of the arteries and blood vessels, veins as well, from the uh, top of the head down to the tip of the toes. And uh, John Moriarty, who is interventional radiologist at uh, uh, UCLA. So welcome, guys. Uh, as we said, the topic is acute venous thrombosis, the changing paradigm. So I, I want to ask you, start thinking about it, and then I'm going to pick one of you guys to answer first. Why has this become so popular? I mean, 10 years ago, this was like a relatively mundane topic, or even five years ago, that was nobody was all that excited about. Why now at every single meeting and every single, you know, virtual meeting as well, this is kind of a hot topic, the treatment of venous thrombosis. So, uh, Mitch, let's start with you. Great. Thanks, Steve. It's a good question. And, you know, I think you're right. It's been an orphan disease for years, right? Undertreated, underrecognized. Everybody that had a swollen leg from an acute DVT was put on oral anticoagulation and kind of pat on the back, good luck, hope you do okay. And, you know, I think in part, thanks to our industry partners, they've given us the technology and the tools to really treat patients with acute DVT in a way that's very safe and, and very efficacious. And, you know, once you get into this space of venous disease, you realize the patients that get treated with orina coagulation, they sometimes don't do very well. And in fact, you know the story with iliofemoral DVT, about 50% of patients have post-thrombotic syndrome with just oral anticoagulation. And it's a huge quality of life hit. It just didn't get taught in medical school well. It didn't get taught in residency. It was an orphan disease, but it's really received a lot of attention. And I think it's great because it's very gratifying to treat. Yeah, I mean, and, and Tom, you, you've been taking care of this stuff since the early 2000s. Uh, but again, it was not like, you know, the sexy thing that people were talking about at meetings. Why, why do you, do you think now, aside from what Mitch said, why do you think now we're, we're all excited about this? Yeah, this, this was, um, you know, I, I first got interested in this back in 2002, 2003, and when AngioJet first came out, and I kind of embraced the technology. And that was always a big no-no. Conservative treatment, uh, you know, was was uh, was basically uh, the treatment of choice. Um, I think it took a long time to get the word out that um, we're not damaging patients uh, when we treat them, and that um, a lot of the treatments really are, are relatively safe. And technology, uh, like Mitch said, has changed uh, so tremendously. And you know, it's a prevalent disease. I mean, this isn't like aneurysms and you're trying to get into a, an aneurysm space. I mean, you know, DVTs are, are, are quite common, um, you know, multifactorial and, um, you know, there's a lot of neat gadgetry that comes out and that attracts a, a lot of, a lot of different positions, particularly now that it's all percutaneous, you know, many disciplines uh, can get involved in this. And I think that's nice because that's multiple different types of exper expertise. You see it right here. Yeah. So, so John, talk to me about during your training versus now in terms of the management of, of DVT. What devices did you have available to you uh, or technologies or techniques when you were training versus, versus what's there now? 
Yeah, thanks, Steve. And, you know, I think I have a kind of an interesting uh, path to this because I not only have the difference between when I trained, you know, over a decade ago to now, but also where I trained and that I did some of my training in Europe versus some of my training here in the States. And so, you know, what we had available off the shelf in Europe was pretty different and is pretty different now to, to what you have here. But I think, you know, if you were to say kind of global sort of themes, you know, in the kind of uh, pre-2010 sort of era, you're really talking about lysis and balloons with stenting to bail out the iliacs after that. And uh, as Tom was saying, AngioJet was one of the first devices. And then Trellis came along after that. That was on the market till the kind of early 2010s. But now if you look at what we have, you're talking about direct thrombectomy devices, aspiration thrombectomy, realistic thrombectomy, uh, an enhanced catheter-directed lysis, whether it's with ultrasound or with a, you know, a basket technology. So it, it's a world apart. And then, like someone was saying, it's, it's kind of the new sexy thing when it comes to interventional therapies. So, so Maggie, so let me, taking it off on what John just said about all the things we have available, just because we have things available, does that mean we should change the way we think about managing DVT? Just because a procedure is easy, should be? Well, that's an excellent question. And we should really get down that pathway just because we have so many fancy toys, we should be using them. But alongside with the industry coming up with these new devices, there is evidence building up. So there where we had the haziness 10 years ago, now we started having randomized trials complete, multiple series, multiple experienced people presenting their good outcomes. And on top of this, having the evolution of the devices, I think these two coming together, we better select our patients, we better select our techniques, we have better outcomes. Yeah, and that, and that, now Makis, I did not share with you my next question, but you set it up really nicely. So my question, my next question was going to be to all of you, was, you know, we were all anticipating the results of the ATTRACT trial a couple of years ago. Did the ATTRACT trial tell us anything that we didn't already know, those of us taking care of acute, you know, venous thrombosis? John? You know, I think it's it was one of the more interesting times to be in the room when something is delivered. Um, that uh, you know, I was there when uh, when Suresh Vedantam kind of released the results, and you you know, you heard everyone just go, "Oh God," you know. Right. And I think it was that the hope had been that this would be uh, somehow change what everyone already knew that we should not be treating every DVT that walks into the ER. But the hope had been that we would find real benefit to fempop disease. So to kind of get back to your to your question, did it reinforce what we already thought? Yeah, it told us that you know everyone with a popliteal DVT does not require an intervention. Did it you know taper the edges on where we are intervening? I think it did as well, and so that you know it's changed some practice probably for the better. I, I mean, I mean, I hope so. Uh, I mean, those of I was there also. Uh, uh, at that, when he kind of presented everything, and it, it it was you know, I mean, everyone was sitting on the edge of their seat. I I agree with you, um, but I think the people who were doing everything right, so to speak, who were thoughtful, it, it just reinforced. But I'm I'm hoping it changed the ideas of those people who were doing a lot of stuff, you know, that maybe those of us here don't think was the, the right thing to do to intervene on, on these people and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Mitch, what are your thoughts about what the ATTRACT trial taught us? And, and as to take off on what John said, taught those people who maybe just DVT, I'm getting rid of the, the, the thrombus. It, it's a great question. You know, I have a different spin on it. Um, to me, it was a negative trial, right? And it was a big deal. New England Journal of Medicine, 2017. And basically the conclusion was is that venous intervention didn't work. And by the way, there was a trend towards more bleeding. But I think the big point is it was a very important study, but it's not the way in which we do venous intervention now. You know, that study started in 2012. It took five years to enroll. And we've learned a lot from 
from the a track finish to where we're at. And if you look at a track, you know, they didn't use Ivis very much. It was mostly venography. Um, their lytic times, you know, where the mean was like 20 hours, we rarely ever infuse somebody that long anymore. Venus stents weren't around, you know, dedicated venous stents, the stent rate was only like 28%. So it was just, it was a great study, but I think it shouldn't have turned people off from it. Um, but the big thing was the sweet spot were the iliofemoral patients. You know, Tony Camarota showed that in that subgroup, uh, if the Velalta was 10 or greater, there was a signal of benefit in the iliofemoral. So the thing we learned, and that's pretty much our practice, is the patients with the sicker leg, the iliofemoral DVT, with high Velalta scores, stand the most to benefit. But now we fast forward to what we've got. We've got these wonderful thrombectomy devices. We use intravascular ultrasound. We've learned a lot about iliac vein compression. We have dedicated venous stents. I think we can do better than a trap, and, and we will. I'm confident of it. Yeah, I think so too. So, so Tom, it, when, when you were licensing these people back in the early 2000s and stuff, um, what was the thought process going around like, okay, we got rid of the thrombus. Um, do we need to do anything else? Was it a low amount of people that we said, look, we got to treat the underlying problem? Or what were most people, were you doing saying, hey, this guy's got, looks like a stenosis here. I got to put a stent in this person. Yeah. You know, interestingly, I, I wish, I wish, you know, I was in private practice at that time and I I just didn't have the ability or the resources to publish my data back then. But early on in 2004, I, I had my own series that I did, uh, which was arterial venous, um, you know, and some AV access, SVC syndromes, everything. And, uh, you know, the data was really kind of very similar that, that, that you see across, across the board. Um, and very early on, I actually came to my own conclusion, uh, which was that, you know, below the inguinal ligament uh, and popliteal, uh, it just doesn't work great. Um, you know, my theory was clean the clot, obviously, just like we do with AV access or anywhere else, um, find the underlying problem because there usually is an underlying problem and, and, and treat it. Um, I even went as far back then to, you know, to, to uh, lice through the leg, wrap the leg and put IVs in the foot and tried to drive, you know, saline and TPA deep into the system. Yeah. Uh, it it just did it didn't quite didn't quite work, you know. So it's it reinforces really what we kind of thought we knew, and 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 in fact, it, it is true now, unfortunately. So so, Maki, so let let me ask you. Uh, I want you to talk about the two extremes, and then all of us are going to talk about the gray areas. Mm -hmm. So give me the best case scenario to consider some type of thrombus removal. And I don't want to use the word thrombolysis because we're going to get into a little bit later on the non-thrombotic uh, treatment and the, uh, the non-thrombolytic treatment and the thrombolytic treatment of venous thrombosis. What to you, monkeys? you get the call from the resident of the ER, which one, what case are you salivating that you can't wait to get in there? Well, that, that, that's, an easy, that's an easy question. If you want the extreme, this is a phlegmasia case. The patient who has like the, the, the extremely swollen leg, extreme pain, and he starts having sensory loss. That's an easy call. Okay, so now give me the opposite easy call, which is what is the patient you absolutely would say, no way, I'm doing nothing, you know? Well, the, the old patient with um, femoral popliteal DVT. A patient more than 70 years old, more than 75 years old with femoral popliteal DVT some and some swelling. Okay, that guy you're doing just anticoagulation. Right. Okay, John, give me one gray patient, one patient where you're not quite sure, should I do it or shouldn't I do it? Give me a, 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 a clinical scenario. I would say the person who is super active a runner, sportsman, whatever it is, and has some limitation based on their, their presentation, but they're in no way going to Marcus's extreme of the phlegmasia, but they are limited and it's getting in the way of their quality of life. All right, so that's a gray area. You're not sure yes or no. All right, 
Uh, we're going to get back to those gray areas. So, um, Mitch, give me another gray area. I, I, I agree with John. We, we see maybe six or 10 young athletic patients a year that just have a femoral popliteal DVT, and they usually do well with anticoagulation, but, you know, maybe 30% don't. And to them, being active, and maybe I had a college volleyball player several months ago, she did not want any risk of post-thrombotic syndrome. And they're young, and their risk of you know thrombectomy and adjunctive lysis is so low. In that population, I think maybe it's okay to be more aggressive. You know, and the younger ath athlete, that um, their leg function's really important to them. All right, so now you, you walked yourself into the swamp sure. okay, you're, in the, you're in the quicksand now okay mitch here here you go you mitch who before we started this uh recording of this podcast you said you really like biking you enjoy it and you do it not just for la di da but you do it for exercise mitch if you had a femoral popliteal dvt what would you suggest you're an active guy. I don't care about your age. Absolutely. It's, it's a great question. I think I'd take a hard look at the duplex. And if my whole femoral vein was socked in and there was no flow, um, with these pure thrombectomy devices, I think the risk of the procedure certainly isn't nil, but it's very low. I might have one of my partners take it out. You know, if I was really socked in from the proximal femoral all the way through the popliteal. Because again, it's a little bit of a roll of the dice. You know, is Eliquis for three months really going to resolve it? Yeah. Uh, and once it gets old and organized, it doesn't respond well to much therapy. So I, I might let one of my partners do it if I'm really socked in with just a femoral popliteal DVT. Would you let Tom or Makis or John also do it to you? I absolutely. That, okay. that's, why they're, that's why they're on the podcast. But I wouldn't want a thrombolytic. I wouldn't want a thrombolytic. Yeah, no, and we're going to and keep the, all these thoughts because we're going to get into that in, in the next question or two. Um, Tom, give me another gray area, if there is any that you can think of. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, anything, you know, for me, anything below the inguinal ligament, um, I mean, you know, femoral uh, on or off limits. I mean, if it extends down into the so-called superficial femoral in the thigh, um, you know, I think that the, the results just just aren't aren't what you want. Uh, everything else for me is, 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 you know, is a go. Uh, any iliofemorals, cables, obviously. So, Makis? To make things a little more gray. Go ahead. Um, well, you know, my, hair, my hair is as gray as it can be, and whatever uh, hair Mitch has is also gray. So go ahead. We are talking about jumping on an intervention, but I, I can challenge you telling you, if you sit on anticoagulation with the femoral public DVT for 48 hours, and your swelling has gone down and you walk around without a problem, would you still want this thrombectomy procedure? Go for a bike ride. A very good chance that your symptoms would go completely away if you do anticoagulation within 48 hours. Right, and you know, Mark, there's a lot of practitioners that practice just that way. They put patients on full dose Lovenox for seven to 10 days, see them back in the office. If they're still symptomatic, then it may be more appropriate to do it. I think that's not a bad option. Um, and patients that we're on the fence with, we sometimes put on just Lovenox. See them a week, 10 days later, if they're still symptomatic, go in and do it. Um, and Steve will get into the devices, but some of these devices do pretty well with more, you know, the classic teaching is 14 days or greater, things don't respond well, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Yeah, so, so John, is, is your practice someone, not a phlegmasia patient, but someone who has some swelling, some pain and everything, they have a um, iliofemoral DVT, um, and they're that questionable, they're a little bit older, they have some comorbidities, you're a little concerned. Um, do you give them a trial of anticoagulation first and then see them back? We do. And it's changed over the last while. So it used to be that that's the sort of patient who probably would have been admitted to our hospital. And then we may or may not have done a procedure during that admission. But now they are all kicked out of the EUR. And so they're the people who come back to our office. They get an appointment for five to seven days. And if they are symptomatic still on their DOAC at that stage, 
then we, you know, we'll have the talk with them and about an intervention. But there is that percentage of people who either don't show up or are uh, are, are symptomatically great. And I think it's, you know, it's a it's a bit of a learning thing for us that there are some of those who definitely, uh, you know, five, ten years ago would have had an intervention and ended up in the same spot as they were with just the, uh, the anticoagulation. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I don't think in general it would be wrong to um, watch somebody for a couple of days. On, 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 I mean, I prefer Lovenox because it's acute and there's an inflammatory thing, but and then bring them back just like Mitch, you guys do and stuff, and see how how they do. Um, but I want to use the analogy uh, of most of you were not around when we changed from open gallbladder surgery to laparoscopic gallbladder surgery, but. Um, and probably most of you were not, were not, didn't do general surgery training. Tom probably did in Makis. Did you do general surgery training, Makis? Yes, I did. Okay. My point is all of a sudden when the procedure became less morbid to the patient, there were many, many more people that were undergoing laparoscopic, undergoing cholecystectomy from the laparoscopic viewpoint. So I want to get into a little bit of the technologies that we have. And because these technologies, Mitch, as you already alluded to, are more benign now than perhaps they were when we we're doing, you know, intravenous uh, TPA or urokinase or whatever, um, does that change our indication? Uh, so talk a little bit about, uh, Makis, why don't you, you give us a little talk about um, some of the, uh, the the technologies, maybe the penumbra device, um, how that works. The penumbra device, I personally started using it around 2016. You know, this um, came out of the stroke world. And when the CAT-8 came out, that was a relatively big device and appropriate for, for Venus. Um, and I started using it in both DVT and TE. We actually later took it also to, to the peripheral arteries, but as far as the DVT, um, particularly when you're treating a clot that's relatively fresh, uh, uh, the Numbra Cat 8 would actually work uh, without any lyrics. But even if you had uh, like a subacute clot, you could actually do pharmacomechanical thrombolysis the way we are used to use it with uh, angiojet. This turbo uh, pulse technique, inject uh, some TPA, and, and I'm not against TPA. Uh, I actually like some TPA for the patient who's not contraindicated. So Pendubra Cat 8 with some TPA on occasion would actually work very well. Just an eight frame sheath, torqueable device, easy trackable device. It's not very bulky and can navigate around uh, without without difficulty. And, and now, and I'm 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 sad because I haven't yet used it uh, the cat uh, the ten. Um, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. I, I anticipate like a, a lot uh, better results, bigger chunks of clot removed. Uh, but uh, I'm still waiting to use it. So, so that's a uh, that's a, a non thrombolytic device. I mean, you can use thromb thrombolytic with it, but in general, you don't have to. Uh, Mitch, you want to give us another thrombolytic uh, device? Your experience with the uh, with the clot retriever. Um, I know you have experience also with flow treatment with PE, but let's talk about clot treatment for um, uh, non, not PE, but for IBC and LAX, et cetera. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, we've got a very busy VTE program. So we've tried all the devices we really have. And clot treatment for iliofemoral DVT has really revolutionized our practice. Uh, it's a pure thrombectomy option. You know, it's very rare that we have to give any adjunctive thrombolytics. And the first impression is, well, that's great. Bleeding complications are going to be less. But what it also means is it increases your therapeutic window for patients that have contraindications to thrombolytics, patients that are post-op brain surgery, spine surgery, that before you had no option for venous intervention. But it also translates into that, you know, single session result. Patients go home the next day, their length of stay is shorter, the hospital system loves it because of the economics. So for us, clot retriever, because it really is a pure mechanical thrombectomy, we, I, I can count on one hand the time we've had to give adjunctive lytics, we get the on the table result and, and it's been very good, it's been very good. Yeah, no, I, I, we've had a good experience as, as well. Um, 
John, now let's let's move into the thrombolytic options. Um, you've had experience with uh, uh, what do you call it with um, thrombolex and stuff. Mm, yeah. So you know the as we were talking about earlier on with the tract, you know the bulk of the evidence for what we do comes about from catheter directed thrombolysis. So if you have something that kind of builds on that evidence and makes it into more of a single session treatment, then that has that has a certain uh, cachet and hook to it. And what the Thrombolix company have done is as they've come out with a, a line of catheters, the Bashir line, which uh, have a basket that expands up on one end. And the idea being that it kind of macerates the thrombus, uh, disperses TPA deep into it. So you, know, you uncover these forbinogen binding sites that previously the TPA wouldn't have gotten into. And then it also has a multi-side hole catheter down the shaft so that you can treat long segments as well. And so we've had, uh, we've had pretty good experience over the last short while, maybe about six months or so with it. And, uh, you know, I think, it, I think it has a role. I think it's, it's been definitely better than what we had before. And I think that, uh, you know, increasingly what we see, to, to Mitch's point, is that, you know, there's a large volume of patients who, who need this sort of treatment and that one device is very good for one portion of that uh, population and that perhaps this will be good for a different portion of the population, maybe the younger people who, uh, who TPA may be a very good option for. So I think it's going to be interesting to see where it fits in with the, uh, the armamentarium of all the devices over the next while. Yeah, yeah. And I, I agree with you. It has it, the ability to, to infuse, make multiple channels and infuse you know, throughout the thrombus rather than just a, a central channel uh, as well. So, you know, the theme of this podcast is um, respect the elders, embrace the new, and encourage the improbable and impractical. Uh, so, Tom, tell us a little bit about the elder statesman here, which is the AngioVac, um, the AngioJet device and Ecos a little bit. So, look, AngioJet's one of the oldest out there, right? Uh, and the nice thing about the AngioJet has always been it can be standalone therapy. It was standalone therapy. Uh, you know, works for for newly principal, shoots saline out, sucks it in, creates a vacuum, and morselates it, takes it out of the body. Um, the catheters have evolved tremendously uh, since then, and now there's the you know Zelante, which is the uh, eight French catheter, which is a, a lot more powerful. We've been asking for that since since day one because we anytime you got into the IVC with um, you know the five French catheters, it just it took forever. Um, you know, the downside, and, and I've noticed it several times, uh, I've had several cases uh, that is, uh, you know, there's a renal, renal issue potentially, and, and that's the scare. So even if you're not thrombolysing, uh, you're still getting systemics no matter what, and you're lysing cells. And, and I think that burden on the renals, if you're not hydrated, can be uh, quite detrimental. So I, I've had two people go into frank renal failure. Um, with full reversal, young people. Uh, I don't know if it was some kind of crazy allergic reaction, but you do have to be careful, particularly with these, these new catheters and if you're in the IVC and around the, the renals. Um, but it, it can be standalone, you know, and the nice thing is pulse spray. Um, you know, we used to do it with clamping the outflow. I'm sure, you know, whoever's been around long enough has did that. And then, uh, you know, that kind of evolved to, to give us the pulse spray full spray uh, functions on the machine. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great all around device. Yeah, no, and, and, and many times we use it kind of as a, maybe not first line, but kind of as a cleanup, if there's anything yeah. left over. So let me, uh, Mitch, you, you look like you want to say something. No, no, I, I'm just, I'm enjoying the discussion. Uh, go ahead, I do want to make a point, but go ahead, Steve. No, I'm going to, I'm going to ch change a little bit. So if you want to make a point on this, make it. The thing that the clot retriever and flow retriever has taught me, and you as a surgeon, you probably have known this, is the clot that we pull out, we actually get to look at it and play with it and touch it. It's very heterogeneous. You know, some of it is bright red and very soft like jello. Some of it is white and it's like rubber. It's like calamari. And I think in part, the patient's, often have more sort of subacute presentations and the clot could be very, instead of very fibrin rich in, a, in an acute clot, it's very collagen rich. And that's why thrombolytics sometimes don't work that way. Um, yeah. And again, that's why I've been really pushing towards this 
this device that um, no lytic, pure thrombectomy, and it's aggressive enough that it pulls you know, the wall adherent nor chronic clot off the iliac vein very nicely. And it's taught us a ton. And as a cardiologist, I never got to see clot like that. It's, it's really impressive how heterogeneous the clot is. Yeah, no, we see that, that but I, I, I just want people to understand, even though it's called the clot retriever, clot only occurs in a test tube. Thrombus occurs in the body. So they should have called it the thrombus retriever or whatever the hell they're going to call it. But but we we all get the idea. We all call it clot. And we because obviously we call it deep venous thrombosis. We don't call it deep venous clotosis. Um, so it is a, a you know it is a it's a thrombus that we have. So let me challenge you guys. Um, why should the algorithm not be for anyone with acute venous thrombosis? Why should the algorithm not be, except if it's a leg threatening you know um, problem? Why should it not be? anticoagulation for a few days, see how the patient does. They're not doing well. The next thing you do is a non-thrombolytic device. And if you can't get the thrombus out of that, you then go to a thrombolytic device. Is there any reason that algorithm should be different? Or is this just somebody jump in? I mean, I think that sounds like a very reasonable algorithm. But still, there are some exceptions. For the patients who have extensive ileal cave or DVT, how many times do you think you can be like, successful with a single session thrombectomy? Even the clot river, even the penumbra, because I like all devices. Mm -hmm. The clot river can not get the entire lumen of the vena cava. Many times we have patients who have IVC filters. Again, these devices do not work great to IVC filters. So let for the appropriate patients still have a role for a few hours. But overall, I think the algorithm you are suggesting is a good start. John? I agree completely. I think it's a really good start. I think there are gonna be people who are gonna start asking about the cost of this. Um, uh, but you know, as someone who kind of believes in the technologies we have and in the results that we've seen in the patients that we've treated, I think it's, uh, I think it's worthwhile in almost all cases. Tom, what do you think? I think we're leaning in that direction. We talk about in conference often. Um, I think that's very, very reasonable. I do think that the ultimate is going to be a combination therapy. I don't think that one is is uh, alone uh, always is going to be enough. And I think a, a cleanup agent of some sort uh, usually helps because the vessels, no matter what, no matter how good they look, or they, you know, they definitely have some fibrin attached and and that's thrombogenic. So if you can clean it up, I think that's going to be, you know, that's going to be uh, uh, the answer in the long run. Uh, uh, Mitch? You know, um, Steve, I'm going to be a little more aggressive and say that in the iliofemoral population, um, when we do intravascular ultrasound, probably about two thirds of patients have some anatomic issue in addition to the thrombus. And that's why you know, 40, 50 percent have post thrombotic syndrome with just anticoagulation because you haven't dealt with the outflow issue. So um, the oleofemorals, if they have a good functional capacity, they're not 90 years old. Maybe we even do 90 year olds. I shouldn't say that. But the point is, um, we investigate the majority of them. And, and part of that investigation is intravascular ultrasound. And you know, about two thirds of patients, we see significant iliac vein compression and, and, and we fix it. Um, you know, we need to have more prospective uh, studies on that approach. You know, the more aggressive approach, we need to redo the attract trial with sort of 2020 venous intervention and see. Um, so our, our center leads to being probably a little more aggressive with iliofemorals. Yeah, and, and, and I do think, and that, that actually was my next question. Should anybody be doing this and not be using an IVUS before they say we're done? In, in my opinion, no. If you're going to do venous intervention you and it's an iliofemoral DVT, you have to do intravascular ultrasound. Venography, and we know that, Raju's published that a few times, underestimates disease. You look at the video trial. It changed the, ther the therapy in 50% of patients. Yes. Magis. Well, to, to challenge this a little bit for the sake of the discussion, 
actually from UCLA, uh, uh, John of Intervascular Surgeons published it. That, and uh, another publication from Anil Kingorani in, uh, in New York, they believe that two thirds of patients, you can get away without IVOS. Just because it is obvious there is a lesion, you stent it, if you follow a liberal, liberal stenting uh, algorithm, you can get away most of the time. I'm personally an IVOS user, but there are many people out there still not convinced and they have good outcomes. If you keep placing the stent, no matter what, you may not need the IVOS. Yeah, Tom? I, I, Steve and I have had these conversations forever and, and look, I'm, I just happen to be old school. Um, I'm turning the corner with IVUS. We use it. Um, I think when it's necessary, I do not use it on all my cases. Um, I kind of go with just my, you know, experience, not experience, you know, with my experience over time, we've had good results. Um, you know, we're real aggressive and, you know, I think that's probably the future, but I do not use it on all my cases. So the, the two last things I want to talk about. Um, are we still missing a lot of patients because we have the DOAX and because ER physicians and primary care physicians don't feel this is a life or leg threatening problem and these people just anticoagulation, nobody follows them and then we see them a couple of years later. Um, are we still at that point? Anybody? 100%. I'll tell you, Steve, how I, how I think I know this is because so many of them are finding us through Facebook groups and patient portals and uh, disability groups and everything like that. So these are people who are not coming to us from the conventional kind of uh, referral patterns, but rather searching out treatment themselves because they feel that they're being left behind a bit. Right. Yeah, and, and I don't think the primary care physicians, the internists, the hospitalists, or the emergency room doctors care whether there's data or not. I think they just feel it's relatively easy to give them a pill and go home. And um, I, it's, it's a shame. There's so many people, because we have so many more devices, which we, we have just uh, elucidated, that can safely take care of these people. And I, and I honestly think that, as I asked you, Mitch, if, if you had your, you know, femoral popliteal DVT, I honestly think the safer these things become and the simpler they, they are, more people should probably wind up having their thrombus removed rather than, than less people, honestly. You know. Steve, Steve, I agree. I think it's a shame in the year 2020 that care is still so fragmented hospital to hospital. I mean, sometimes you got to, they don't even think about the diagnosis yeah. of DVT, but then they get the duplex, it's an iliofemoral DVT, and they don't get a consult. They don't get the doc involved that really understands the disease. Sometimes they get a vascular doc and they don't do the right thing, you know? And I think um, DVT is something that could be very much put into a care pathway. Almost. You know, 90% of the time we can probably do the same thing. Um, yeah. Care is very fragmented. And, and John, you're right. We see a lot of people months to years later that have chronically swollen legs and that window of opportunity was lost because they got undertreated. So, so, all right, let's, let's get down to the end here. So what are we missing? I actually have a couple of things I think we're missing, but I want to get your, your guys' thoughts first. What are we missing in the management of acute venous thrombosis? Anything or we have everything. I'm not even talking about devices. I'm talking about a thinking process. I'm talking about a diagnostic process. Is there anything we're missing that we could, we would want that we could make the care of these patients better? And if you guys uh, have it, from your last comment, um, we are missing awareness and the education of, of the public and, and the community physicians. So that there is an appropriate referral pattern to the, to the large institutions where appropriate expertise exists the better care of these patients. Right. All right, so let me, I'm gonna throw some things out because you guys didn't have time to think about this. I did before this, this uh, podcast. How about, would it be good if we had better criteria to determine the age of the thrombus? Would that be helpful to us in managing these people? 
it would be helpful, but I don't think it's solving the problem that, that Marquis was talking about is just awareness, right? People th- making the diagnosis and then when the anatomy is such iliofemoral, high risk, getting it to the right doctor, you know, the care is still too fragmented. I'm sure I think that would be helpful if we could use MRI or what have you to really date the the, 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 the thrombus, but I don't know at the end of the day how much it's going to really help, to be honest. Um, my last comment about a track, though, the unintended consequence was the primary care base looked at that as a negative study. Yeah. And we did see a drop in referrals, and my friends across the country did also. So we got to educate them that, you know, the technology post-attract is much better. Right. So, so John, what, what should be our endpoints when, not even if we're doing a trial, what is our endpoint when we're treating the patient? What, what are we going to say, hey, we did a good job here. We helped the patient. What do you think the endpoint should be? I think you're talking two main things, right? There's the technical endpoint. And on the technical endpoint, you really got to get almost all the clot out. And when I say almost all, you want to get 99 to 100% because there's nothing more thrombogenic and, and uh, cholinogenic within the, uh, within the vessel than residual clot. So whatever we're using, we want to get a really, really good result with it. And then from the patient's point of view, they don't really care about that. What they care about is their quality of life. In other words, you want to have a good metric for uh, their for their leg pain, swelling, and walking metrics. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, that's, yes, we need to remove the thrombus. A lot of studies have shown the more residual thrombus, the less the patients don't do as well, and they have a higher rate of, uh, of re-thrombosis. Um, but I think the quality of life is really the main thing. And the best thing we have is a Vilalta score, but it's not the best, really. We're all saying that and we're all like, you know, okay. But in every single paper, the Vilalta score is quoted that it got better in all these people. Um, but yeah, the quality of life is really the, uh, the key. Um, fast forward 10 years from now. What is the, Tom, what would be the best thing? What would be your, like, the, 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 the world of Oz, the land of Oz in the management of venous thrombosis? What do you want to see? Someone hits the ER, iliofemoral DVT, swelling, pain, not a threatened limb. What, do you, what would you say? What is your, like, fairy tale ending? Well, uh, obviously a non-invasive external something, whether it's ultrasound based, that will, you know, that will break up the clot without any kind of invasive intervention and put all of us out of business, which is <laughs> good for patients, but bad for us. Well, okay. You're very being very altruistic. I, I don't know if I'd be that altruistic, but 10 years from now, I may not be practicing. So that's okay with me. Um, John. You are the Wizard of Oz, John. Yeah. You, you are going to make everybody happy. What, what do you want to see? I think I'd want uh, two things. The first is, before this happens, I want someone really famous to get this and get it bad. And I want to see uh, a lot of publicity about how bad it is and how great they would have done if they'd have got seen and treated early. And then when they when 10 years from now, they do... They're the people who know this person come in to, uh, to see us. I want a device that is low profile. So ideally one that's uh, easy to put through the popliteal. Uh, that is uh, a mixture, I think, of a removing the thrombus directly by whatever mechanism that is and uh, dissolving the uh, any residual thrombus. And potentially one that also re-sculpts the vessel so that our stent numbers are perhaps not as high as they need to be right now. Very interesting. You probably have them two years, not 10. Oh. <laughs> Marquis and Mitch, you're the last guy, so start thinking. I'll follow John's thoughts. I want this small profile device that gets into a tibial vein around the ankle. It has an ibus eye, it can thrombectomize. And you can also throw lyrics through. Yeah. Mitch, I like that. 
You know, Steve, we always have room for improvement. I think device size right now is on the large size, you know, clot retrievers 13 or 16 French in the popliteal, but we're almost, I mean, in our practice, we're almost at nirvana. We have a pure thrombectomy device. We IVIS, I'm telling you, most of the clot is gone. If there's compression, we put a dedicated venous stent, give them Lovinox on the table, they go upstairs and uniformly they go home the next day. So um, compared to what we were doing 15, 20 years ago, this is, we've landed, we're in a good place now. Right. The device sizes could be smaller. Um, all right, but but I, I kind of like Tom's idea too. If we can do it all from the outside yeah. and put us out of business, that's the only negative part of it. But um, yeah, no, no, I, I agree with you. I think I think we, we've shown there's a lot of really good options that have occurred in the last couple of years. And I do think if we get a little better data, we're going to be a little more liberal than we are now in, mm -hmm. in getting out this thrombus with people because we do have young active people who develop it and even older active people, as well as, uh, you know, all the, the routine stuff. Um, I, I want to thank you guys. Uh, great discussion. And um, we will see what happens, whose predictions come true. So uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks for having us. Thanks. So. Good night, everybody. Good job. Really good job. We hope you enjoyed today's Vein podcast in association with Radcliffe Vascular. We aim to bring you important topics from the Vein world, either topics that we ourselves feel are important or you, our listeners, feel are important. So review us on your favorite podcast app or send your thoughts, comments, and questions to podcast at Radcliffe with an E dash group dot com. That's podcast at Radcliffe dash group dot com. You can also register to access newsletters, videos, and peer-reviewed journal articles. Thank you. Glad you listened. This is Dr. Steve Elias, and we'll see you on the next Bain podcast.